Okay, Sanj, how are you? This is uh, a really great deal because we're just going to talk as we always do, but we're going to record this because we have so many uh, people that are asking us about Brain EQ, who are the people, how did it come about, and uh, it's almost like telling the story of somebody else's story. So <laughs> for those people that don't know you, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, a friend of, of mine and, and of thousands of people throughout the world, uh, we have gotten into a really good, I think, clinical safe space dealing with people with concussions. You're in Toronto uh, live. I'm in uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida. We're in the middle of this uh, coronavirus pandemic. You've had a lot of experience with that as an emergency department doctor for years. You worked through the SARS epidemic, avian flu, a variety of other things. So you've got a lot of experience, uh, which is fortunate for people with that. But you also have uh, a great experience with concussion, with brain injury. And that's been a, uh, a passion of yours and of mine for, for many, many years. So what I'd like to do is brain EQ is sort of the buzzword with most of my patients throughout the world and so many clinicians of all disciplines that are using it, the gamification, all of this sort of thing. So let's just sort of go back to the beginning. Uh, you were seeing patients that had head injuries uh, in, in the hospital, in the emergency department. And then I know that you were, you know, you're a little bit humble, so I'll tell a little bit about you, that you had really been the, the head guy with the establishment of medical facilities throughout Canada that uh, really, you know, welcomed society in a great way and uh, found the, the need, if you would, to realize that if you can't get patients into the clinic, you can't serve them very well, what's an alternative? What's a realistic alternative? And then out just at a great opportune time pops EQ that gives us top quality validated uh, medical uh, examinations, demographics, data that people can do at home. So just sort of take us back into this brainchild and, and sort of the, the mission to develop the technology and, and how you came to this, this part right now. I'm happy, happy to do so, and thank you, uh, Ted, for taking the time to, to just chat. This is great. Um, one, of my, one of my personal struggles um, as I was leaving the eMERGE and starting to move into uh, working in the clinic was we really, there was a tremendous amount of variability in how people were diagnosing concussions, which meant that there was a tremendous amount of variability in outcomes. Um, and I, I felt that the lack of diagnostic objective data was really impacting patient care. Um, and so that was the catalyst uh, clinically to um, move into uh, what we're doing at Highmark Interactive, coupled with, I had a, an incident with my daughter where she had a, a minor head injury. There was concern around potential concussion. And I had between my wife and my mother and my daughter asking me, well, is she concussed or not? My answer was, I, I don't think she is, but I'm not sure. And they looked at me and said, well, why not? And I said, well, we don't really have diagnostic tools yet. And as I said it, I thought, you know, I, ha I have to do something about this. This is crazy. And this is back in 2016, which led to Highmark Interactive, and, and here we are. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing, amazing deal. Now, the, the one thing everyone knows, if you're talking about someone who deals with concussion, Everyone knows about Brain EQ because people are using it. It's marvelous. It gives us the basically King David sort of thing with eye movements in a, in a magnificent way where the doctor doesn't have to sit and have a, you know, a stopwatch and then look at their eyes and see if they're saying the, the, the letters that you know, are on the uh, King David cards, on those four cards. It's done in an amazing thing. It coordinates a hand-eye, which... Is, is really super. So for everyone that's in brain activity, everyone's using it, but what about people in your experience now um, that are using EQ for non-concussions? What's the utilization in the general medical practice, would you say? Well, there's there's been a definite increase uptake because what increasingly we're seeing people do, I mean, EQ uh, at its base is really designed to measure different trajectories of brain function so that we can get an understanding of, of any individual 
pre-potential um, head injury or uh, would anything else that might impact their, their brain. So uh, we've had youth and athletes and people that are active onboarding in that first phase. We now are seeing clinicians onboarding seniors um, to better track uh, individuals as, as young as 60 to ensure that cogniz cognition is stable as it can be. There's no early warning signs of you know, dementia or degenerative uh, brain changes. Um, and that gives both the patient and the patient's family and the clinician a tremendous amount of reassurance to see, you know, dad's cognition is stable. It's not changing. It hasn't changed over time. Furthermore, you know, he ranks in the top 65 percentile of all people over 75. And so the anxiety drops for the patient, the patient's family and loved ones, and the clinician can take a step back and say, you know what, Mr. Smith or Ms. Jones, you're good for 75. Keep doing what you're doing. And so it's been really exciting to see that take take hold, um, and even more so now in the in the unfortunate era of, you know, COVID-19, where you you want to visit your parents potentially in a nursing home or retirement home, but we're trying to keep the vulnerable population away. Um, families can stay in touch through EQ and see that their parents are still you know, active, engaged, doing the test, playing the games. There's no change in their cognition. There's nothing to suggest there's any other systemic infections. And it's been a real gift for families and caregivers and clinicians in a time where we're looking to create some of that social distancing because of COVID. Yeah, I think it's, it's marvelous. I think the concept of being able, we hate to say baselines uh, anymore, but when we look at, or, or pre-injury tests, almost suggests that you're gonna have an injury. But I, I think to have a valid biomarker or biomarkers on patients that are readily available does allow us to compare. One of the things that I found was just super exciting with the EQ was the, uh, the, the validity or the reproducibility of the test over time or the uh, what we call the Cronbax Alpha or the idea that if you do something today and you do it tomorrow, if something hasn't happened in between, it's a valid test, which means we can use it to, to demonstrate change. And yeah. you talked about uh, dementia and you talked about people as, as we age, having the ability to, to see a mark, valid marker of a decline allows a family the, the unfortunate reality of being prepared. Like, do we need assisted living for yeah. your mom or your dad or somebody else? And I've, you know, talk to people about this. And it's, it's always that question like, well, how, how's she going to be in a year? Well, you know, we don't know. However, if we start to see these declines, we have trends and I'm just super excited. Have you had some, some experience up uh, in Toronto or throughout the world with uh, people that are using EQ in regards to neurodegeneration, brain disorders, et cetera? Yeah, we, we have. So, um, Increasingly, the, the retirement homes and the long-term care facilities are deploying this um, because you're exactly right. They're getting data, and that data allows them to have trends, which allows them to run our predictive analytics and model out best case, this is what these scores will look like in 12 months, worst case, these scores will look like in 12 months, and um, you know the most likely case. And what we're finding is if families are prepared in advance, both psychologically, financially, and physically, the, the um, way that they, they cope with this, which is very devastating for families to know that they're losing um, you know, a mother or a father or a grandfather, it gives them time to prepare, it gives them time to see the data, it gives them time to visualize the graphs, it sinks in a bit, bit deeper, but it also gives them a sense of empowerment because they can see, okay, the trend uh, is not that steep, so we can have more time with our, our grandmother or our father. And um, at the same time, if the, if the curve is steeper, we can put things in place like a walker potentially or a row bar so that they don't fall and have complications when they don't need the complications. And when, when people feel they have control, that makes dealing with a crisis or in a situation much easier because they're not just helpless. That's wonderful. And you know, it's everyone that I meet that's in the brain business, if we'd say, knows about EQ. But believe it or not, there are some people that don't know about it uh, that, are, that are treating people. And, and I always feel like, you know, where have you been hiding? But let's assume 
that you, you're talking to a doctor who hasn't heard of EQ. What can you do just to sort of summarize the platform, the availability, the ease of it, et, et cetera? Give a like sort of an elevator talk of what EQ is. Sure. sure. Um, what we say to, to clinicians when we, when we first talk to them, if they haven't heard about EQ, is uh, it's a um, FDA cleared CE mark medical device. But the device is software that runs on your mobile application. So if you've got an iPad or, or a cellular phone, you have the ability to use the technology. The technology takes seven to 10 minutes to test a patient, and it gives you objective quantitative data and qualitative data about the brain health, which touches everything from degeneration of the brain to cognition to mental health disorders. We know that one of the first things that happens when someone's struggling with a mental health disorder is their cognitive uh, abilities start to be impacted. And so when clinicians hear they can get all of this information that's been validated through the FDA and the testing takes 10 minutes, it can be done anywhere, and all the person needs is their mobile device, at first they're, they're, they're shocked. They're like, come on, where's the catch? Um, and then when they hear the only catch is a one-time single fee licensing fee and they can use it for all their patients, um, it, it, it gets picked up pretty quickly. People are pretty excited by it. Well, it's sure cheap, uh, and you know, thank you and, and all of the, the people who have been involved in this project to bring it to the world. It's, it's amazing. Uh, the, the thing I think that a lot of people wonder is, you know, like, is this like too good to be true? You've got all the things that we do in the clinic, like putting helmets on and uh, you know, fancy gizmos and technology that we all love and depended on, and you can now have it in, in your iPhone or your iPad. And, is the stuff good? Does it give you a validated data? Well, you know, we've been working with groups of collaborators throughout the world to answer that question. And the answer is yes, it's valid. And uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more of EQ uh, after the new consensus comes out in Paris. And I know that uh, some of the people you work with, Chris, and some of the other doctors are going to be there. Everyone is excited about this. The price certainly is, is something, you know, both of us really don't concern ourselves with that, but the consumer or practitioners do. Uh, and I was really thrilled to find out from, uh, from a colleague that EQ has like a basic price and then everyone in their clinic, it doesn't matter if it's a small one or a big one or a super hospital or whatever, uh, is under that plan. It's not like per person, it's like one fee and they can test as many people and as many families as possible. It's almost like, uh, like a gift. And that's true, right? It's absolutely true. We, we, uh, we looked at utilization and we looked at, you know, what might be barriers to, to adoption for, for widespread use. And uh, we didn't want uh, cost to be um, a barrier for anybody. So we looked at this and said, you know, the company needs to, to, to operate and make a little bit of money. But um, if we can price this at a point where a clinic can offer it, not just to 10 or 15 or 20 or hundred people, but to everybody, then the reason we got into this business was to make an impact. It was to improve patients' lives. It was to improve patient outcomes. Um, now everybody within a clinic can access EQ. That clinician can manage those patients remotely if they need to, if that, if that individual gets injured, on holidays, they can do the EQ scores and the clinician can see it on their dashboard and say, oh, you need to shut you down. You've actually re-injured yourself. We really wanted to eliminate as many barriers as possible. And that was why we, we changed the pricing. And now it's, uh, we've got clinics that are using this to actually move into the community. We have one, one clinic in particular who has just landed um, all the first responders in a large US city. And the, the relationship uh, that was struck was the individual said, well, I'll do the baselines. If there's ever a concussion, the first responders will come to our facility. We'll have all their information through EQ. Um, if there's an issue in the field, I can real time look at their EQ scores and say, pull them off or keep them in the field. And that's enabled that clinician to continue to service her clients, but also bring new clients in in a new manner. And she will, that clinic will have all of a very, very large U.S. cities first responders on EQ for um, baseline, for any concussive issues, and for any musculoskeletal issues that might happen over the course of the year. So when we see that, 
it's exciting to us. It's rewarding. It's what, it's what drives us in the morning to get up and, and disseminate the technology as easily as, and quickly as possible. Yeah, I love it. I, I just think it's, it's marvelous. And the fact that you get the data right there. I know uh, I was overseas and I was conducting my clinical rounds and I had a, a patient that had a, um, a spinal cerebellar uh, type of a, a syndrome, non-SCA spinal cerebellar. And I was able to, to really do some magic with her, but I gave, gave her the EQ. And then when they do the test, all of a sudden you find that what you saw on the Monday is markedly different than what they're seeing on the Tuesday. And I could immediately make a change in therapy without having her in or before her visit. And that I thought was great. I had another really well-known uh, athlete that had a serious head injury and I was gone. I was away. And you know how patients are. They oftentimes have a doctor phobia. They don't want to see anybody else right. because they sometimes had different experiences. So the EQ was absolutely marvelous. You have the scat, you've got the numbers, but the, the King David, everything was so great. Balance was super. I was able to have a Skype and to have like a telemedicine talk and based upon what I saw in the EQ, I was able to really make a significant difference with her like exponentially, really, really quick without having her having to, to wait to see me or to go through the fear of seeing somebody else uh, that may or may not have worked out. It was absolutely, uh, absolutely beautiful, really. And that, that's amazing. That's mu music to my ears. And uh, I mean, we, we, get, we get that feedback um, fairly regularly and it's, 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 uh, incredible. It, it, it's the feeling when we know that we're allowing clinicians to impact patients' lives positively, nothing, nothing beats that. Um, we're getting feedback now during this time of social distancing. Pa cl clinics are saying, you know, how do I manage my patients? And, you know, I, I, I want to treat them, but I'm not supposed to see them. And they're using EQ. They're having their patients do their testing at home. They're following them along and they're saying, I've seen your scores. Let's do a Skype consult or a phone consultation. This is how we're going to adjust your treatment plan for the next two weeks. And so it's enabling uh, clinicians to care for their patients despite social distancing. Um, and if, you know, if people are traveling, athletes, um, clinicians, they're always connected. Uh, and that data is always available. We've got uh, tremendous redundancy in our systems, which we need for HIPAA compliance and FDA clearance. Um, and so it's been very exciting to move from concussion into sort of the elderly market and, and see the technology really take hold in the, in the sort of broader, we were in 29 countries. I, I, it's stunning sometimes when I think about that. Yeah, it's absolutely phenomenal. I know uh, right now with the COVID-19, my group at Cambridge is very actively looking at uh, mental health considerations of social phobia, if yeah. you would, as well as the the neurological or the brain-based consequences of having viral infections. If you've got a fever or whatever, your, your brain function goes down. So this EQ is really, you know, it's not a diagnostic biomarker for, for COVID-19, but it certainly is a biomarker of your function and can really help doctors almost do the triage of, of something. If you see something's going downhill, it's going to raise an alarm. And I know um, you've been, you were instrumental with Chris and, and some of the other people during that SARS epidemic in Toronto. So you've got experience with it. How do you think that uh, having brain EQ at that time might have changed things a little for you, just in a retrospect? Well, you, you, it's, it's a great question. It's a fantastic question. Um, if we had the ability to stay connected to our patients um, not put them in harm's way, we, I, I believe we would have had less patients get infected, uh, less healthcare workers get infected, um, which would have translated into lower mortality of healthcare pr practitioners like ourselves and lower mortality of some of our patients. Um, unfortunately, we, we just didn't have the technology at that point at, at any scalable manner um, at a cost point that made sense for the market, but we have it now. And so we're encouraging our patients, unless something has changed dramatically, unless it's a fresh injury, uh, stay at home, do your EQ testing, we'll look at the scores. If we need to do a Skype call, we'll do it. If a phone call will suffice, we'll do it. Um, and it's worked out exceptionally well. 
It keeps the patient safe. It keeps the clinician safe. It keeps the clinician active and busy in their clinic so they can maintain patient care. Um, and at, at the end of the day, I think, you know, that will be one piece of the puzzle that helps us sort of flatten the curve as a society where we really come together and look at what can technology give us to keep us safe but still maintain health. The other point that you talked about is the, the impact of being quarantined for 14 days or even longer potentially if lockdown happens um, and if that triggers a mental health issue. If, if an individual's cognitive scores start to drop in the absence of any trauma, that would be um, a flag for the clinician to say, maybe these scores are dropping because of anxiety or depressed mood or dysthymia, exactly what you said. So um, there's tremendous flexibility in how the technology is used, given that the clinician is um, interfacing with the patient regularly and watching those scores and watching for trends. Um, we believe it, it will, in fact, we're, we're trying to do a case study right now to look at outcomes and look at patient satisfaction, patient engagement, clinician engagement, um, to, to sort of have real data to justify what we're saying and what we believe we're seeing real time. Yeah, it's really, really marvelous. Well, the one thing um, that we all know is that people hate doing paper and pencil tests. Uh, everyone say, you know, from, from old ink blots and things coming down, people don't like, you know, putting down personal, you know, information. And sometimes, especially with athletes that we see, they, they lie about their performance because they realize that if they score at uh, level A, uh, that if they hurt themselves, they could be in jeopardy. So they'll dumb down their responses to, to level C. So what I found was really amazing was that the EQ is, is gamified, which means it's sort of fun. It's not like someone saying, okay, I'm going to give you this phone number and say it backwards, and I'm going to give you these sort of things or N1 or N back test. It's a game. And I love it because when I play, I, I enjoy it. So I think the gamification of it gives you a truer window of, of someone's performance because they're competing not only against themselves, but to a, a virtual community of people. Can you, can you tell me about what the physicians in your, well, globally, I guess you can speak of it, are finding in regards to that participation and gamification? in uh, in brain yeah. health i mean people uh, clinicians love it um because they feel they're getting more accurate data and and the reason is, is and you nailed it um when the when the athletes or or just the end user whoever that is um logs in and realizes it's a series of games um all of their defensive mechanisms around medical testing sort of drop um, number one. Number two, when they realize there's a leaderboard and they can compete with their peers and their teammates, um, they want to accelerate. And then in addition, we've, we've set up the game so that if, if individuals are trying to game the game, so to speak, we'll be able to detect it. So if someone, for example, says, I'm going to click on the, the fastball page every three seconds, well, the cadence is off. And so they'll have a disproportionate high number of strikes, which tells us this is somebody who's really not trying to hit that ball. So um, for the most part, people love it. They, they, they find it engaging. They want to improve their scores because one of the things we do is we give them a score and how they rank on a normative band. And so people who, who find their scores are, for example, in the lowest 10%, next thing that happens is their, their next test is literally 10 minutes later and they've jumped and improved because they're trying harder. And so we're getting the opposite response where people are trying to do their best. They're not threatened by the typical medical testing. They love the games. They want to compete against their peers. Um, and inside the technology is a way for us to catch individuals who still might be trying to game the game, so to speak. And we just identify those on our, our dashboard and say, come on, this is for you. It's to protect your brain. Um, let's be compliant. And thus far, uh, we haven't had any negative feedback from patients or clinicians, um, and it's just been a lot of positive. Kids love it, adults love it, seniors love it. Um, we changed some of the uh, some of the size of the, the the icons for the seniors market, but we haven't had any negative feedback on. I don't really like to play games because, I mean, even I play video games on my on my mobile device when I'm sitting at the airport waiting to catch my flight. So, um, feedback has been tremendously positive thus far. 
Yeah, it's it's brilliant. I mean, people are people are catching on. So uh, we're in the in the brain business with all that goes around with it, and tools like this really help us help other people. I think at a at a greater level. I think myself when I look at the EQ platform, I was like, you know, blown away because it was almost like a a wish list that's been delivered or, you know, looking at the, at the base of the chimney when it's January waiting for the big guy to come down. <laughs> it. So having, you know, had it and, and used it, I just see a whole load of, of applications. And I think that oftentimes that people that are dealing with, you know, brain injuries or neurological disorders uh, sometimes forget that there's a whole other complement of comorbidities out there from diabetes on. We just published a recent paper with our group that showed a, uh, a, a, a very high statistically significant uh, relationship between type 2 diabetes and depression and then concussion and depression. So that if you're depressed, you have a high probability of developing type 2 diabetes. But if you've got type 2 diabetes, you're going to be depressed statistically. We did some interventions that were great. But now with this EQ, we're, we're going to be able to see those traits uh, mm -hmm. in the neurocognitive world without having the patient coming in, going through that white coat, you know, phobia and, and other sort of, sort of things. I think it's amazing. Let me just say a little segue here because, you know, Toronto or Canada now is sort of like, you know, the legal, legalized <laughs> world. I mean, everyone is saying, I'm going to move to Canada because I can smoke dope. It's almost like Holland, but, you know, it's just boom, boom, boom. But I do know, uh, talking to my colleagues up there, that people are, are, are becoming, are going to work stoned. Yeah. And uh, that can affect a whole load of things. Tell me about EQ in regards to environmental health or ergonomics, the utilization of, of that device. So you, that's that's a great question, and, and and it's a real it's a real issue. I mean, we've got uh, people who are driving school buses, city buses, um, you know, working on cranes, uh, and so what we what we've done is we've created a module called EQ at Work. Uh, it's for employers and employees um, because we live in a in a time where whether it's an opioid epidemic, whether it's cannabis um, being legalized increasingly through North America and through Western Europe, um, or alcohol. Um, there are more reasons for a worker to show up at work and not quite be fit for duty. And so having a really quick test, so the EQ at work module is um, compacted, looking at their fitness for, uh, for work. It's uh, five minutes of testing, so it's even quicker. Um, and it allows the employer to know if, if Sanji typically scores here, and then one day I show up and my scores have dropped significantly, it's not meant to be a gotcha test. It's meant to be something, something's off with you today, Sanjeev. Maybe, maybe you're jet lag, maybe you have a head cold, maybe you know you, you experimented with something last. Who knows? Today you're not going to be behind the garbage truck or the city bus or the school bus. You're going to be in the office working on paperwork. And then tomorrow, when you come back to work, we'll see how you are. Sure enough, the next day, I, I'm not going to experiment and and not that I experiment, but you know what I mean. I come back to work the next day, my scores are back to my baseline to where they normally are. The employer says, okay, great, Sanji, get behind the city bus, get on the airplane. And it impacts, I mean, it's not just safety sensitive, it's not just construction, it's even uh, software companies that are uploading a critical piece of code. If your coder is, you know, impaired, um, that could crash the system. And so you really need in, in every industry to ensure your workers are fit to work, um, and what eventually will happen is you'll improve productivity because they'll know that, yeah, I have to be fully on and you'll be able to actually improve productivity. But in the near term, we wanted to ensure it was a quick, easy way to ensure safety, both for the employee, the employer, and the broader public. And the uptake on that has been fantastic. That's great. And you've got government and community support with all of this. Yep. It's been, it's been great. People have been, uh, in fact, we've had, um, overwhelming demand both from uh, levels of government but also from researchers saying this is fantastic if I can if I can decide somebody's impaired versus not impaired with a mobile test that I can use anywhere so we've got a couple of large trials um, where they're looking at the technology to see can it be used outside of just the workplace 
to give law enforcement potentially some guidance as well. That's just absolutely amazing. What a great deal. I know like when you're driving down the road and you get some of these, you know, drivers, you know, they're sick. They've got, uh, it's, it's a hard job. They're sitting, they're sedentary. They don't exercise. A lot of them uh, are obese. They have sleep apnea. They're, they can fall asleep. We used to have the little cards that they'd only be able to drive for, you know, X number of hours a day, but X number of hours might be good for one person, but not good for another person. What a great deal to incorporate these types of testing uh, just for community safety. I'm just jazzed with it. And I know the utilization is just popping up uh, over, the, you know, all over the place. Well, I tell you, Sanj, you know, for you and, and your team up there and the global team of, of scientists and physicians that are on board with you, uh, people are dedicated. And this uh, is, is a pretty amazing uh, deal. Everyone's excited with it. These are, these are sad times for our world right now. But I think that the excitement of, of having other tools comes through, that we can get the joy of being able to help people, which sort of gives everyone, you know, that uplifting spark, which is beautiful. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's great. I mean, really, thanks so much for, uh, for the dedication to get this out. It's cutting edge, it's contemporary, it's the buzzword. And, uh, you know, you're, you're right, you know, in the middle and, and central of it. So well, I expect, I, I tell you, you know, no, no smoke here, but I expect that everyone uh, should have uh, EQ in their pocket on their phone and should test regularly. It's fun, but the data that we get, this is better than a super Framingham study. We're just getting data from people and they can have it. I think what's really important for people is, is to realize that their data is secure, that when they're, they're looking at something, it's not that their scores are up there and somebody can see them, that these are HIPAA compliant Correct. instruments. And when they, when they play this game and they're sharing you know, their, themselves with, uh, with the app, that, that secure information that their physician can see and that nobody else is gonna be able to grab. I think that's so important. Correct, no, you're absolutely right. And that, and that, that was why we, before we began even commercializing it, we wanted to make sure uh, we were HIPAA compliant, we had that, that stamp, and that we were FDA cleared. Um, so that people had the reassurance of, of knowing this wasn't just an app, this was truly a class two medical device that runs as software on your medical device, on your, on your mobile device. And so, um, it's been exciting, uh, you know, thank you very much for, for your perspective on it. You're incredibly respected. You, you, you've been a trailblazer in, in, in treating, diagnosing, managing everything from, you know, traumatic brain injury to the, the neurologic sequelae and, and, and correlations that go along with it. So to have um, those words come from you is, is very humbling and, and, um, and I'm very grateful and thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a great day. Well, Sam, uh, I think this is great. People can sort of get an idea of what we talk about in a little bit of a, a bit and share. And uh, thank you so much. And I'll speak to you really, really soon.